For the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Shining as the sun. Last week we spoke about overcoming evil with good. Following the exhortations of St. Paul in Romans chapter 12 and 13, which form part of the lessons appointed for the Sundays during the season of Epiphany. During the Epiphany season we celebrate the manifestation of the light of Christ to the whole world. The light of Christ was progressively manifested over time, more and more until its full manifestation. In the same way, there must be a progressive transformation upon the life of all those who receive and follow the light of Christ in this world. In Romans 12 and 13, we can follow that progression through the various exhortations given by Paul so that we may present our lives as a living sacrifice, not being conformed to the corruption of this world, but being transformed through the renewal of our mind in all aspects of our lives, beginning with our inner spirits, continuing with our relations with one another as members of the body of Christ, and finally, transforming all our relations with the rest of the world by learning to recognize all authority on this world as a divine provision for our good, which we must learn to honor and submit to. Today is the fifth and final Sunday on the season of the Epiphany for this year. And once more our lesson instructs us in regard to the key principles for living as Christians in the midst of a fallen world. Our Gospel lesson is of particular importance because it is one of the few parables which give us an at a glance picture of the whole history of salvation from beginning to end. In the parable of the tares among the wheat, also called the parables of the weeds. This parable was explained by the Lord a few verses later when after dismissing the crowds, Jesus went to the house and his disciples asked him to explain the parable of the weeds of the field. And he answered and said unto them, He that sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the terrors are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. And the reapers are the angels. As therefore the terrors are gathered and burned into the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and then we do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father, who has ears to here. This is probably one of the most important parables of the Lord for our time. Not only because it provides the general picture of the story of salvation from beginning to end, but also because it clearly establishes a number of key teachings which run directly opposite to many ideas that are commonly held in our day. First note that Jesus clearly taught that the age, that is, human history as we know it, 
will have a definite consummation, which will be like a harvest. Our time will come to an end. And at that end, what will happen is final judgment. Then in principle, the whole of humanity will be finally and forever separated into two groups, which currently are mixed and hard to discern one from the other. But this will not always be so. In the end, every person will be sorted out as a member of one of two mutually exclusive groups. In the parable, these groups are identified as the good seed planted by Christ and the bad seed planted by the devil upon the field which belongs to God, which represents the world and is identified by Christ as his kingdom by the end of the parable. At the end of his age, the Lord will send his angels to gather out of his kingdom all the stumbling blocks and those practicing lawlessness. The angels here are in charge of removing from the Lord's kingdom the evil seed, which is then gathered and cast into a furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing. But on the contrary, the good seed planted by Christ, that is the righteous, will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Note how evil is removed from the world, and the righteous inherit the earth, just as it is often foretold in the Psalms and the prophets, while the wicked are finally and perpetually removed from it. This picture runs directly opposite to the expectation most people have in regard to the end of the age, when they expect the church to be taken out of the world by God's angels in a secret rapture, while the wicked are left in this world to suffer years of tribulation until the Lord returns once more to establish a reign of a thousand years after which there is a battle ending the final judgment. But none of this convoluted process is ever hinted at by the Lord in any of the many parables the Lord used to clearly illustrate the end of the age. Final judgment. In order to clarify our duty as stewards to be ready for the return and judgment of our Master. And this is probably why the parable of the tears among the wheat and the parable of the judgment of the nations are mostly, as well as others, left behind when teaching about the end times. Anyway, the message of the parable is clear. The servants are not allowed to go ahead with judgment before the time. But they are instructed to wait until the time of harvest. In the meanwhile, weeds and wheat are allowed to grow together for as long as it takes. The weeds or tares are very similar to the wheat in the early stages of their development. Therefore, it is easy to mistake one for the other. This parable then prepares us to face a confusing world in which the good seed and the bad seed, the counterfeit and the real are mixed together and hard to discern until the fruit of each one is fully grown and finally sorted out by God himself, who knows all things and who cannot be fooled. Of course, this is not what the world likes to hear. Instead, it proclaims that since the mixture of good and evil is so subtle, there is no real difference between one and the other. And it really does not matter since everyone will be saved in the end. But both these ideas are directly contradicted by this parable and the teachings of Scripture. Human judgment does not determine the quality of the seed. 
Rather, it is the person who planted each seed which determines the true nature of each seed. The seed planted by the sun is holy. The seed planted by Satan is evil. And these two are never confused, one with the other, before him who knows the heart and for whom nothing is hidden, but all things are manifest. And finally, the judgment of fire of the evil seed presents the clear teaching of eternal punishment, another subject of which our times want to hear absolutely nothing. Today, even high-ranking religious figures and scholars have gone on public record expressing their belief that all religions are the same and that there is no danger of eternal punishment to anyone since either all will be saved in the end or the souls of the wicked will be annihilated as if they never existed. Anyway, hell and eternal punishment are subjects from which most preachers shy away as if scriptures and the church had nothing to say about them. But the truth is that Jesus taught and warned more about the dangers of hell and eternal punishment than anyone else in scripture. And he clearly taught on this as a valid reason to encourage us to pursue holiness of living in this world. It was Jesus who said, for example, You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her heart, with her in his heart. If your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off, throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body go into hell. If the Lord spoke like this, it is because it is good for us to keep in mind the awful reality of these judgments, as well as the permanence of such promises of blessing. Of the faithful, it is said that then the righteous shall shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father. We will be like Christ, the Son of Righteousness. This is the future of God's elect, as Paul identifies and exhorts the good said in the epistle lesson we read, Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on hearts of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with each other and forgiving each other. And in verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing each other in all wisdom singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with grace in your hearts to God. And all, whatever you might do, in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. So is the cup of the seed planted by the Son for the glory of the Father. This is how the sons of God ought to behave in the midst of this world, regardless of its license, chaos, and confusion of good with evil. May we have ears to hear, hearts to treasure, and hands to obey that sacred word, that growing in his image, the light of Christ may shine more and more in us until we become like him, shining forth as the sun the kingdom of our Father, to whom be all honor and glory, now and forevermore. Amen. Let us pray. O Lord, we beseech you, 
keep thy church and household continually in thy true religion, that they who do lean only upon the hope of thy empty grace may evermore be defended by thy mighty power through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus and he said, For blessed to give that we see. Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, they have. 